This is the Human Action Podcast, the weekly show looking at politics and events through the lens of economics, with your hosts, Jeff Deist and Dr. Robert Murphy. Well, welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Human Action Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Bob Murphy, and with me is Jeff Deist, who is calling in. He's on vacation in an undisclosed location in Florida. Jeff, do we have you? Yes, in cold, rainy Florida, where spring break, uh, spring training during spring break has been canceled due to the Major League Baseball strike. And I feel you have some strong feelings on that. I do. I do have some feelings on that, but I I won't uh, issue them here. (laughs) Okay, so it seems like that maybe the thing we should talk about today, or at least start with our conversation, um, things that have changed slightly since the last time we talked, Jeff, situation in Ukraine and world energy markets, of course, is still in the news, folks. And one of the developments has been that President Biden has now announced that the U.S. and I think the U.K. also, they are going to embargo or, you know, not not accept imports of uh, Russian oil. But Biden conceded that that some of the European allies, that might not be a path they can follow us down on. And so just to explain the the logistics here. So what's happening is the U.S. actually, um, and, and for those of you who are older and you may have grown up in an environment when the U.S. was always this huge importer of of oil and, oh boy, we, you know, we're, we got to wean ourselves from foreign oil. That actually, because of the fracking and um, horizontal drilling revolutions that happened uh, in the last decade or so, actually the U.S. is much on a much more solid footing in terms of being able to produce the oil it consumes. It's still a, a net importer, but it's not nearly the degree that it used to be. And the, the numbers I checked, the U.S. basically doesn't get any of its crude oil coming from Russia. So the U.S. saying we're not going to accept imports from Russia isn't a big deal. In contrast, Europe gets about 40% of its natural gas from Russia and about 27% was the figure I saw of their crude oil. And it's not even evenly distributed. Like so, Germany, for example, is very dependent on Russian natural gas, um, and, so, and so that's why when you see the comments from various leaders in, in the EU, they're saying things like, "Yes, we you know we deplore the Russian aggression in Ukraine and so forth," but right now it's not realistic to you know it would be it would be far too painful. We're not we're not there yet to be able to completely abstain from uh, Russian energy exports. Well, it, it seems to me, Bob, the first casualty is always truth uh, in, in any war. And we're seeing just absolute economic illiteracy presented as fact. Uh, so, yes, uh, I did some digging last night, and it, it appears that only about 8% of U.S. imported oil comes from Russia. So it's a little easier for us to be uh, morally upright because we don't need it as much, uh, you know, relative to some of our European counterparts. Now, maybe they've made a mistake in a socio-political sense of, you know, buying or requiring that much oil from this uh, cronyist state of Russia. Okay, but that's sort of a different question. But I guess what bothers me is this idea that we need to politicize this immediately. Uh, Jen Psaki, the White House's press secretary, this dunderhead Elizabeth Warren, who somehow made her way to the U.S. Senate, uh, it, you know, basically saying, well, this is oil company greed. They're using this opportunity to, to crank up their profits. And Jen Psaki, which is just, of course, absolute nonsense. And then Jen Psaki is trying to say, this is Putin's oil hike, you know, so we need mm-hmm. to absolutely demonize an entire nation based on their uh, leader of sorts. And and so that's what's so depressing here is that in this day and age, we can still, people can still get away with this kind of rhetoric. Yeah. And by the way, just to reconcile in case some of you in the audience have cognitive dissonance, like Murphy, you just said there was 0% and Jeff said there was seven or 8%. The distinction is because I ran into this too when I was looking at these numbers, Jeff, if, it, if crude oil, you know, narrowly, I don't think we get basically any from Russia, but petroleum imports, that's what they call 7%. And, and so petroleum, the way the EIA defines these things is a slightly broader category than crude. So in case folks at home think that Jeff and I are making up numbers, we're saying the same thing. It's just the definitions that these, these reports use uh, differ slightly. Um, it, it, yeah, you're, you're right. So I, I saw a funny thing, Jeff, where it was one of those memes with the, cl- you know, the guy putting on the clown makeup. 
And it started out saying, uh, you know, in, inflation is actually is not happening. And then it was inflation is actually good for the workers and bad for the capitalists. And then the next the final pain was the infl- inflation is Putin's fault. You know, so that just the various stages of how the Biden administration is dealing with rising prices. Uh, it keeps going through all these ridiculous loops. Well, I guess what mystifies people about oil as a commodity relative to other commodities is that it experiences such huge fluctuations, seemingly overnight. I mean, when you're driving around town, um, you see gas prices, even during normal times, go up or down a few cents, and then they'll maybe trend one way or the other for a while. But Bob, other commodities don't do that. If you're buying bread at the grocery store, for example, that may contain wheat and flour. Um, You know, it may go up over time, but it never goes back down. It doesn't go up and down. And so what, what makes oil such a unique commodity. Obviously, it needs to be refined before it works in your car. Uh, but wh- why are there these wild swings? Why is it so politically or geopolitically sensitive? Okay, that's a great question. And why don't I first just make sure the listener realizes just how dramatic these price swings have been. Um, so uh, the the benchmark, the European, the, the Brent crude oil. Um, so it was earlier this week. I think it's come down a little bit since then, but early on this as we're recording, so that this would the, the week of March 10th. So earlier this week, it had got up to about 140 a barrel and it had been in the 70s just in early December. Okay. So that's almost a doubling just in a few months, which is you know pretty uh, uh, extreme. And then natural gas, the situation is even more dire uh, the figures I saw, the natural gas prices right now in, in Europe, like the the Dutch hub is one of the, the benchmarks they use over there, that that's tripled since October, and it's up by a factor of eight since last April. Okay, so again, it's it's like if you, the number that was last April, you'd have to multiply it by nine to get the current natural gas price, all right? And so that partly underscores some of you folks at home who may follow this stuff. They were calling it a full-blown energy crisis in Europe even before uh, you know, let the, the recent outright invasion or even the hostilities building up that, um, you know, something is really screwed up with the natural gas market in, in Europe in particular. And it's, it's not just, oh, is the world economy re- rebounds after COVID. Um, so the, so natural gas prices there are just le- levels far higher than anything anyone's seen, whereas oil, it just kind of rapidly returned to the pre-pandemic levels. So to answer your question, Jeff, it's, yes, oil tends to be very volatile. I think it's, a few things. So one is that it's, it's a global market. And so events around the world can affect it. And, um, and it's, there's also, I think part of the issue is there's a, a pretty small margin of error, right. In terms of, you know, the, the, the match between global consumption and, and global production that if, if, you know, that the production falls off, you know, there, there's not a, a big margin where, whereby, they can just make it up somewhere else. Okay. So it's, I think that's, that's part of the issue. And so that's why whenever there's a geopolitical event, then speculators, you know, rationally and often correctly think that, oh, that's going to mean higher oil prices, at least in the near term. And so then they bid the price up right away, you know, speculatively, which I don't know if we want to talk about this, Jeff, that's actually a good thing. Like that's what you want markets to do. If oil is going to be relatively more scarce in terms of the fundamentals a month from now, you don't want that the full brunt of that to hit consumers in exactly one month. You want them to be eased into it, and that's what speculators do when they push the price up in anticipation of disruptions that may not have yet hit but might hit a few weeks down the road. You want the speculators to push the price up so people economize now, other sources have time to get up to speed and you know, and so forth. So that's, that is the market working, but in terms of why is it so volatile, I think it's partly because they have, they have a pretty narrow margin of error there to match uh, the quantity supplied and demanded. And I think there's a lot of political reasons for that. I mean, oil has been demonized for the last several decades, you know, especially with the climate change stuff in general. And, and, and you know, if you're a rational investor, you're going to be pretty re- reluctant to go ahead and sink billions of dollars into expanding your capacity when you don't know what the landscape's going to be in 10 years from now. Well, and we've had a real Marie Antoinette moment on the left the last few days, this let them eat cake, let them buy EVs, of course, electric vehicles are not cheap, uh, and replacing the batteries in them is especially not cheap, when, uh, it, which affects the resale value of them mightily. 
Um, and I've also heard uh, com the commentary on the left say things like, well, you shouldn't be driving. You shouldn't be using 30 gallons of gas a week anyway. Who even does that? Because they tend to have no conception of people who might live in rural areas, mm -hmm. for example, where the distances are far. They might have no conception of people who drive big trucks that suck down a lot of gas. They don't like big trucks. Um, not all big trucks are just a status thing. Some people need big, powerful trucks to carry tools or to, you know, haul, uh, uh, you know, hitched wagons, whatever it might be. I mean, this is, th this strikes me as, as a bad look for the left. It, but what's interesting is I think this might be an opportunity, just like COVID was an opportunity of sorts. This might be an opportunity to say, look, people, given the state of the world, capitalism's unreliable, there can be wars, uh, we need to wean ourselves off this dirty, nasty oil, which is the source of so much conflict on Earth. And we need to be moving towards green, renewable energy sources. And, but you know, Bob and I could do a whole show uh, with Seyfi Amus and others about how unrealistic that is if you really expect people to be able to heat and cool and drive and have things brought to them on trains and trucks over the next 50 years. The idea that we're going to do away with fossil fuels is almost unbelievably naive and almost sadistic in the sense of what that would mean for people's standard of living. And what we really mean is people's standard of living in the third world. But this, this demonization of oil is real. And I think that uh, this idea, well, it's your patriotic duty. Who cares if you have to pay a little bit more at the pump? We're at war. Well, actually, no, we're, we're not at war. Russia and Ukraine are at war, last time I checked. Uh, the other thing that irritates me, Bob, is that the Bakken shale formations up in sort of along the Canadian border, up in the North, North Dakota, so that, that region of the United States, this is a little known fact, uh, which was not trumpeted at the time, but back in 2013, when as we were really starting to realize uh, what the ba Bakken shale formation meant in terms of just quantities underneath our soil, uh, the Obama administration, the Energy Department, put out a press release that basically said, you know, we got about 60% more oil than we thought we had, we meaning within U.S. borders. So uh, now shale is not as good. It's, it's a little harder to process and turn into uh, you know, usable oil and then into ga refined gasoline. But, you know, this idea that we have to be dependent on this chaotic world supply is just nonsense. I mean, as a factual matter, we have enough oil and natural gas within the United States to be utterly self-sufficient and still export. Now, I'm not an autarchist. I, I think we should get oil from wherever we can get it cheapest. But this idea that we're beholden to geopolitics because of this, and so we need to move away from fossil fuels towards so-called renewable sources because of the sort of the dirty politics of oil it just isn't true, Bob. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you hit that point, Jeff, because that, that's something that you know, I, I, as you know, Jeff, I spent several years working for the Institute for Energy Research and got hip deep in this stuff. And that was one of the eye opening things to me. And, and again, folks, part of it is just the, the technological innovations of perfecting both fracking and what's called horizontal drilling, you know, where they where they go down and then they can make the pipe go horizontally and, and go find you know the oil deposits that way. And so those two, the interaction, those things, I mean, U.S. natural gas production, like basically doubled over the course of a few years. I mean, just to give people an idea of just how significant that in, those innovations were in the industry. Um, and, and that's why the situation changed so much. And there's assessments of things, you know, like especially if you consider North America as a whole, looking at just the fossil fuels they have and just, just you know, standard industry estimates, even relying on government estimates, as you say, Jeff, you can rely on the Obama administration. So this isn't something you got to go to the Heritage Foundation to dig up. And I mean, there's at current rates of consumption, there's literally centuries worth of coal, natural gas, oil, and so on. Now, there are varying degrees of being able to be developed. And so economically, it doesn't make sense you know, if, if Saudi Arabia can bring a barrel of oil to the surface more cheaply than they can in Alaska, then you'd go ahead and do that. But this this notion that, oh, yes, the world is running out of oil and therefore, you know, we, we got to wean ourselves from it is wrong. It, you know what it reminds me of, Jeff? So this it is, I think it's not just the left, too. I think it's also there's some strands of this in the neocon uh, wing on the right where they think that, oh, yes, we, we how can we stick it to these Middle Eastern dictators, these people over the overseas 
is we got to make it so that we're not reliant on their exports because that's the only card they have to play against us. And so that's why at home, you, you do see there are some people like James Baker and so on, people that you normally wouldn't think of as a you know hippie leftist that are all in favor of a big carbon tax, for example. And so there's a, there's a movement on the right wing for a carbon tax. And of course, in their way, you know, they say, oh, we'll have it be revenue neutral and because we're smart and, you know, we consult with Arthur Laffer and so on. But th- I think that's partly what drives them is, is geopolitical concerns. But what's weird about that is it's, it's, they're saying they're, they're hobbling U.S. fossil fuel development in order to make us less reliant on foreign fossil fuel development in their eyes, which makes no sense. It's sort of like back, if you remember, Jeff, during alcohol prohibition, when the authorities would go around and randomly poison bootleg alcohol so people would get sick and die just to show them this is how dangerous bootleg alcohol is. You know, <laughs> like, like they were making the problem worse than if they had just minded their own business. Well, the EV push is really something. I mean, obviously we know about the subsidies, but the battery issue is, is really a problem. I mean, the range on these EVs, especially when you start getting into trucking, where they travel long distances, especially when you start talking about electric airplanes, where the range is going to need to be, you know, quite large, quite far. It, it really is something. Um, look, Eddie Rickenbacker, the, the flying ace, was involved heavily in the automobile industry, the nascent automobile industry in the U.S. in the 1910s. And at the time, there were hundreds and hundreds of tiny manufacturers all battling it out to see whose car might make it. And they were very much, I mean, the idea of use, having it be battery powered, electric versus combustion engine was very much an open question in the 1910s. No one knew which was going to win out in terms of affordability, efficiency, uh, range, you know, marketplace preferences, etc. So this isn't something brand new. And they struggled. I have a, a wonderful biography, or excuse me, autobiography of Eddie Rickenbacker. Uh, and they struggled mightily to string multiple batteries together to try to figure it out. And, and so this range issue is not, it has not been solved. And I'm not saying it's unsolvable, but I recently rented a, a big full-size SUV, sort of like on that big Cadillac Escalade size, three-row thing, whatever. And, I, I mean, it had a 600-mile range on a full tank. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. I mean, that is really something. That's That's... That's a significant market advantage, and um, I don't know how far they're going to go, but I, I, what I fear with the majoritarian process we have in this country, with everything going through Washington, um, and virtually all environmental regulations now preempted and going through Washington, that the climate change people are going to prevail, and they're basically going to start squeezing combustion engines with the, the, the CAFE standards, the corporate a- average fuel economy across the range, across the fleet of a particular manufacturer's vehicles. They're going to squeeze that so much higher that, um, that EVs will effectively be legislated into our lives rather than chosen by the marketplace. And I think we've already seen that to an extent. Um, you know, and I'm not down on EVs. They have instant torque. You know, when you go from zero to 60 in a combustion car, those first, uh, that f- zero to 10 is, is much slower than 10 to 20. Whereas with an EV, if you've ever driven a Tesla, I mean, that torque will put in you in your seat right away. And that's, you know, that's a market advantage, I suppose. Uh, but I-, I fear, I fear that this Putin war, this this oil thing is going to be all sort of used as fodder for what I consider a very anti-market and very anti-human environmentalist left. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jeff. And, and I'm glad, you know, you, you emphasize that it's, it's, it's not that we are saying, oh, fossil fuels are good and, you know, wind turbines for sissies or something like that. You know, it's let the market decide. I mean, that literally, and yes, there's pros and cons of the various technologies and in certain areas, for example, little niche markets where it's really windy a lot. And so, yeah, the wind turbines make a lot of sense that, you know, you, Hey, nature's doing it automatically for you for free as it were, and you just got to harness it. Um, but there's, there's downsides. Like, so with electricity production that, yeah, it just wind doesn't always blow. The sun doesn't always shine. And so that's problem with wind and solar and why you need, you know, so-called dispatchable energy sources. And that's why even places that rely heavily on, 
so-called renewable energy sources still have backup natural gas generators, for example, just because they, they there's times when the city's needs cannot be supplied purely from those sources. And like you say, Jeff, with, with vehicles driving that say what you will, but you know, gasoline is, it's a very dense energy rich liquid. Uh, and it's, it's just a very convenient way to, to power things. And the other thing too, is it's not merely solving the battery issue, but then just getting the infrastructure in place. So it, it can't be that if everybody had an electric vehicle tomorrow, there wouldn't be enough charging stations because right now Europe and the United States, you know, they're, they're designed, they have regular gasoline stations all over the place. And that's where you go to refill your vehicle. And so it would take time. It's not just, it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem that people can't transition too quickly into all having EVs unless the infrastructure to recharge them for long road trips is also goes along with it, but you're not going to build a station that caters to EVs when the market doesn't have that many right now. So it's, you know, that sort of issue as well. But again, it's, we used to have a horse and buggy and then we switched over to automobiles. And my, you know, the joke I use is it didn't take a manure tax to force everybody to switch over from this silly technology of relying on horses and how dirty that is to, to driving cars. People voluntarily did that and the market switched over of its own accord because it just made a lot more sense. And so likewise, when it, it it's, it's interesting, Jeff, I don't know if you've noticed this in the energy debate where the advocates will tell us how great and how cheap uh, you know, electric vehicles are and everything. And, oh, yeah, they passed the market test. Don't listen to those old fuddy-duddy conservatives who are warning about economic pain. They're, they're always, you know, the sky is falling. Uh, and, and yet it's critical that we have all these government policies, like a huge carbon tax or outright mandates on the percentage of renewables to force people to use the technologies that they're telling us already passed the market test. So it's like, well, you're actually admitting, no, they, they don't pass the market test. And so, of course, you know, they'll, they'll bring up the, the, the Trump card of climate change and say, well, that's the, the wild card that doesn't actually, uh, you know, people aren't taking that into account, but still a lot of this rhetoric, it, when they, so even, I guess my point is even on their own terms, if they're admitting that the government is going to have to force us down our throats to get everyone to switch over, to wean us from foreign oil, especially from that dastardly Putin, then if people need to be forced to do it, it's because it's less convenient for us, you know, other things equal. And, and, and so that's going to be painful. So you might say the pain is worth it, that the cost is worth it, but still to, to, I think it's very disingenuous when the, the left often tries to bill it as, oh, this will create green jobs, you know, as, as if like it's the government just outlawing the way we do things right now is going to make us wealthier. Cause now we got to have all these workers adapt things to the, to the new requirements. And so, if, I mean, if that were true, the government could just randomly ban Hey, anything that's purple, you can't use anymore. And look at all the jobs they'll create as we make things now that aren't purple. So that's, I, didn't, I just picked that because of my shirt. So, you know, that, that's the, the, the level of the economic illiteracy that we're, we're dealing with here, where something that causes us to work harder to get the same result is, is viewed as good because it creates jobs. And, and no, actually, economic progress occurs when we get more stuff or the same amount of stuff with fewer inputs. That's, that's what efficiency actually is. Well, I wonder how we might more localize energy production and energy source. I mean, that's that's the libertarian argument, I guess, against big corporations and far away fossil fuels. In other words, oil needs to travel from places where it can be found and brought out of the ground more cheaply to places where it's needed for cars. So oftentimes that means pipelines, oftentimes that means ships. So oil, the oil we use, sometimes it comes from the U.S., but it also comes from from vast distances. So if you take a country like Mexico, Mexico has vast oil reserves off its shore, and it could be a very wealthy oil exporter, it, you know, like the Middle Eastern countries, but it, it's expensive uh, to, to get that oil up out of the seabed. So that's, that's a big process. And uh, Mexico has basically a state-owned and operated oil company called Pemex. So it's, in a sense, it's akin to the old Gazprom, which was in a very cronyist way privatized in the former Soviet Union. But so you have these companies, uh, and even the ostensibly Western private ones, the big oil companies, uh, which have to deal with so many 
countries and jurisdictions, and then they have to run these pipelines across so many hundreds or thousands of miles or even under the sea that you get into all kinds of libertarian property questions of eminent domain and, and you know, problems like that, apart from, you know, the environmentalists don't really love that, although I think pipelines are generally not bad for wildlife. Um, so you get into all these kinds of questions and you start to say, well, isn't it a little strange that I need to run my car in Phoenix off of oil that came from so far away. And, and I suppose it is a, a little bit strange, but uh, the, the thing here is some libertarians argue that, for instance, nuclear power wouldn't exist in a truly free society because although nuclear power is, is pretty green and pretty clean, if there, when and if there is an accident, the, uh, the harms from the radioactive fallout are so great that the nuclear power plant could never pay or even insure itself against those harms that it would inflict on society. So in some sort of Rothbardian tort system of regulation, you know, the costs, the potential costs of a, uh, of a, you know, a problem with a nuclear plant, a meltdown or something like that would be so, so high that they, you couldn't even insure against them. And, and thus, no even super huge firm would ever grow to the size where it would undertake nuclear power. I, I wonder, Bob, if, if um, there is an almost libertarian case against the fact that we have you know, become, become so dependent, for instance, on the Middle East, you know, because of our anti environmentalist our anti-drilling, and also our anti-refining attitudes here in the United States. In other words, we want oil, but we don't want it in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Like if you go down to Ron Paul's hometown of Lake Jackson, Texas, which was basically started in swampy uh, Gulf, Gulf South Texas by Dow Chemical, a place nobody wanted to live, they created a bunch of chemical refineries and oil refineries because that was considered kind of a less desirable place. And so, uh, but today it's, it would be very hard to create a Lake Jackson, Texas, almost impossible, I would argue, within the United States. So because of our attitudes, we, we source a lot of oil offshore and, and we, don't even, we refine a lot of oil offshore. And so as a result, we end up with this unbelievably Byzantine patchwork of uh, global oil production. And that makes us a little bit more susceptible to wars, for example, and you know, just to supply chain disruptions and, and, and transport disruptions. So it seems to me that we've had one market intervention on top of another, all the layers to the onion that have gotten us to this point where in the United States, I mean, why, why couldn't we have um, oil that we use in our cars come f basically from the nearest state and the nearest refinery in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah, good, good point. And it's um, what you're saying there, Jeff, reminds me that I had heard... Uh, an old oil industry executive was, was explaining, you know, to a friendly crowd that, you know, part of the issue with like the Exxon Valdez, you know, these, these big oil tankers when they run aground or something, you know, and they spill all this oil. And, and he said, well, that's partly because of regulations that prevent us from drill, you know, having pipelines. Like it's a lot safer and, and cheaper. Just if, you know, if we, if we know it's got to go from, you know, somewhere in Alaska down here to a refinery south of there, then we just build a pipeline. But if, if for various reasons, because of concerns about the wildlife, you can't do that. Well, then you got to put it on a ship and, or similar thing with, uh, you know, the, the Keystone and so on that it's not that Canada is just going to say, Oh, okay, I guess we're going to get out of the oil export business. Well, no, if they can't just ship it directly, then they're going to go ahead and, you know, go East or West with it and then load it on ships. And then they're going to take it down and then it'll get unloaded at a dock somewhere and then it'll get put on, you know, so it's, there's ways that it gets moved around and, and yeah, just banning one particular method, like a pipeline really doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't keep the oil in the ground the way that some of the activists think it will. And it ironically makes it more likely that there's going to be spills, just they might be in a different area. Um, and, and you're right too, Jim. I, I don't want my remarks to be construed as a blanket endorsement of that Keystone project, because yes, there were some issue, genuine libertarian uh, issues of, eminent domain and you know they were going to go through and, and and seize property from people that weren't giving consent so i'm not you know rah rah about about keystone per se there's there's some genuine issues there but certainly the the attitude of people saying no more pipelines because we got to get off of oil that attitude and even if you were to push those policies through that doesn't 
therefore mean we're not taking oil out of the ground and using it. It just, as you say, Jeff, just making it move around a lot more and, and increasing the likelihood of there being an accident. Um, another thing too, just to add to all the different issues you, you raised is I know, for example, like in California, they can't sell the same gasoline in their stations that they sell in Alabama, that they you know, they have environmental regulations in mm-hmm. terms of the quality. And so you need refineries designed specifically for the California market. And so that, again, that's part of this, uh, what's making this, this, this market so uh, discombobulated and having things getting shipped around that, you know, something on paper might make more sense. Like how come we don't just have it go from here to here? Isn't that easier? And, and they can't do that necessarily because of these regulations. Well, I guess the, the question now is, what does this mean for Biden? I, I mean, I have to agree. I saw that the, uh, an MSNBC article yesterday that said, oh, no, no, these Republicans are trying to pin this on Biden. And it's Joe Biden's fault that fuel prices have gone up. But as you were saying, you know, even before this, this uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, they were already talking about an energy crisis in Europe. I think oil prices per barrel were going up even towards the very end of Trump's term. So I, I think that's that's true in a sense that this this isn't Biden or his administration's doing. I mean, he can't control world events, but what he can do is affect the regulatory environment in the, here in the United States. And I think we all know that he, he's not going to be pro-oil or pro-refinery. Right, yeah. I mean— Let's also not forget to mention the Federal Reserve and, you know, European Central Bank and other central banks, too. They certainly have contributed a lot, you know, with all the, the torrent of monetary inflation they unleashed during the, the COVID uh, scare, that that certainly has something to do with, I think, this this huge upswing in commodity prices. Um, and you're, you're right. So it's it's not that Biden is, is responsible for all of these direct causes. It's more, you know, what what steps could he take to alleviate the problem? And certainly he's, he's not doing those like allow for more U S production. Um, and then you, you, you alluded to it earlier. We didn't really discuss it, but like Elizabeth Warren coming out and, and you see a Robert Reich and all the familiar characters are, are using this opportunity to say, Oh, see the, the big oil they're they're just using this, these events as cover to jack up prices and pad their bottom line. And that's why we need a, a windfall profits tax. So just in general, I mean, even if you thought that were true, right? So even if you thought that oil prices are set by the whim of the of the oil companies and they just wait for when people are going to believe a cover story, I guess that, you know, in other words, if, if big oil had jacked up prices to four or five dollars a gallon a year ago, people would have balked. But now that there's a situation in Russia, they can go ahead and do it. And, and people, I guess, are going to foolishly pay these prices, even though they wouldn't have had a year ago. I mean, that's kind of the implicit model that these people have when they say they're, you know, the companies are taking advantage of this situation. Um, but even if you thought that were true, okay, so yeah, let's say big oil is this, this big greedy monolith and they just wait, you know, to, to stick it to people when they can. How is imposing a big tax on them going to help anything, right? That it's t- taxing a company doesn't make them want to lower their prices, especially if you had a model that, you know, this is this company that's very greedy and it uses events in order to jack up prices. Why wouldn't big oil say, well, we just got hit with this huge profit tax from Elizabeth Warren. So now we got to pass it on to the consumer and raise prices even more. Right. So even in her own worldview, it's not clear to me how raising prices, raising taxes on big oil is supposed to help the little guy. Well, I know that station owners make only a few pennies per gallon, and that's constantly adjusted above their cost. So they're actually counting on you. When you fill up your car, do you get you know, 20 gallons, they, they might make 50 cents off you. They're counting on you to come in and buy that bag of chips or that soda or co- coffee or something, that which is where they're actually making their money. But beyond that, I'm, I'm just not sure that Americans understand the extent to which, let's say, $10 per gallon gasoline would absolutely devastate the U.S. economy. And I, I'm not sure everyone understands how far flung. I mean, our country's built on roads <laughs> and roads are roads and transit. I mean, you know, you go to Texas, things are far flung. Things are really far apart. You go to the, you know, go to Southern California. That is car culture that people are so far apart. And oftentimes, you know, inflation has driven housing farther and farther away from work centers. So what they call the Inland Empire uh, in Southern California, for example, along the 15 freeway, there are lots of people 
who live out there because, well, up until recently, not so much now, up until recently, you know, you could get a house out there for maybe 400000 or 500000 instead of a, a million. And so those people drive huge distances every day oftentimes uh, in their commutes to, to go to work and pay the mortgages on those houses. And it, it's it, this is not something... Uh, that, that people ought to be taking lightly or say, well, it's just, a, it's just a minor cost for most people. I mean, the less money you make, the greater percentage of, of the money you do make is spent on really basic things like gas and groceries and rent. And um, I, I don't know how the Democrats turn this to their advantage because I'm not sure that they can control where gas prices go or tamp them down between now and the midterm elections. And I'm not sure that their narrative is going to work. I mean, Americans like the idea of green energy. I think Americans, in some senses due to propaganda, like the idea of electric vehicles, but they don't like them that much. Uh, that, I, I, I think this is, this is a real problem. I, I'm actually very, very worried about what this might mean for average Americans because everything you get, everything you buy, everything you consume at Target, got there on a truck, at least on the last mile. It may have been on a train, it may have been on a ship, it may have been a, on, on an airplane, but you know, the last mile was on a truck running diesel. And I don't, I don't know how you re-engineer you know, transport in, in the U.S. quickly enough to electric or anything else to deal with $10 a, a gallon gas. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. And Unfortunately, you know, some of these people who have designs on, you know, a different vision of the future, they don't like the American way of life. They, they want people not going out of their house, you know, just staying in their own little cubicles and plugging into the metaverse and getting all their products, you know, delivered with Amazon. And even there, I, I appreciate that still the Amazon trucks are running on gasoline. So that's, or, or diesel. So that's going to um, increase the, the price there. But yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, there's, there's been a war on, as you, as you know, Jeff, I'm sure like on the left, there has been for decades, this notion that the American automobile represents the you know, crass American capitalism, you know, consumerism and oh, individualism, you, you think you're king of the road and you get to go where you, instead of rubbing shoulders with the, uh, with the unwashed masses and ma in, in terms of, you know, subways or something that for, for some people, the idea that this is going to permanently wreck the ability of people to have their own vehicle and, and take their kids to soccer practice and whatever, they're going to think that's a good thing, you know? And, um, so, uh, I think it's, it's a feature, not a bug, unfortunately, for some of the people that are in positions of influence. Um, so, so some of this stuff, it, it may be that, yeah, that that's what they want to have because it, it fits in with things they've been pushing for a long time anyway. Well, on that pessimistic note, perhaps, uh, but, but we're realistic, folks. We will tell you the cold, hard truth here on the Human Action Podcast. We will wrap up this episode. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, and we'll monitor these events. And Jeff and I will be back soon with another episode to keep you up to date. Catch Jeff and Bob next week for another show. But in the meantime, you can find a world of content like this at Mises.org.